So the next on the program is the uh, panel discussion, which will be chaired by Bernd Kasparek, who is coming from Humboldt University in Berlin. And our guests are, as I already said, Barbara Beznitz, coming from Slovenian Academy uh, of Science and Arts, uh, Andrei Kurnik from University of Ljubljana, and Marta Stoic Miltrovic, coming from our here Serbian Academy of Science and Art. They all deal in their, uh, in their work with uh, migration. And uh, Bernd, please. Well, thank you very much and a uh, warm welcome from me. Um, I'm very happy to have you all here because I have learned a lot from you over the last years um, in personal exchange, more in writing. So I'm, I'm really excited that we have a little time to discuss um, what has been going on, what has been mentioned already a lot in the talks that we had today and yesterday. And the title of the panel is Seven Years Later, Old Roots and New Patterns of Contested Mobility in Southeastern Europe. And it will last approximately an hour, our round table. And we'll start with the short introductions which we have prepared and then I hope we can uh, get into a, into a dialogue on, on what we have heard and what our, our interpretations of it. And um, so the panelists have already been introduced. And I would like to start with Barbara with the question, since uh, we're dealing with the Balkan route and it has undergone many, many transformations since 2015, many, many changes. Um, might I ask you to catch us up and bring us all in in what has happened over the last seven years and where we stand today? Yes, uh, it's working. Hello. <laughs> <coughs> thanks, Bernd, and also thanks to the CURE project for inviting us here. It's an honor. Um, well, we heard a lot already about uh, the impacts of various crises that hit the continent and also the world in the last decade. And I would maybe like to argue how these different crises have uh, contributed to um, further fragmentation, um, closure of Europe, and also mainly how, it, how they contributed to, uh, let's say, um, further divisions within the EU on the axis between uh, <coughs> center and periphery. Right? So like the first crisis, the financial crisis, um, we all know that citizens bailed out financial markets, there were austerity measures, um, cuts on investments in um, public sector, mainly culture, health, education. So obviously, this reinforced uh, the already existing um, social inequalities, but they also caused um, an out outbreak of divisions within the EU, mostly uh, like with the interests of uh, the big core economies such as France and Germany, pitted against the interests of more smaller peripheral economies such as uh, Spain, Italy, and most notably Greece. So uh, this crisis somehow uh, exposed the um, unequal structure of the whole Eurozone, right? So um, also nationalist tensions and uh, anti-European sentiments uh, somehow began to rise, but were not fully yet exposed. But of course, this changed rapidly <laughs> um, during and especially after the refugee crisis of 2015 and 16, um, where now the South and the Southeast uh, continues to be most exposed to migration, mainly due to geographical exposure, but also uh, <laughs> due to various European arrangements, such as uh, Dublin regulations. 
um, and simultaneously they are bearing uh, like a huge responsibility for uh, welcoming and caring for new arrivals, even though the South was the one that was mostly devastated during the financial crisis, right? Um, in addition to this situation, there is the ongoing, let's say, ongoing or hopefully finished corona crisis, uh, which seemed to have somehow generalized the uh, state of exemption to the whole of population, populations. Uh, and once again, the first responses uh, to the crisis were... <laughs> You know, closures of national borders and restrictions on the freedom of movement, um, and the declared uh, states of emergency. Well, I don't know. At least in Slovenia, we had a declared state of uh, of emergency, which allowed the governments basically to rule by decrees, which severely limited possibilities of. Uh, social, political, economic participation, and many, many, many countries have slipped further into um, authoritarian rule, let's say, right? Um, well, you know, European integration, European Union has somehow proved to be unprepared to face all these uh, <laughs> crises adequately. So um, we are facing uh, decreased trust into European solutions and the rise of, rise of nationalist responses. Um, we are witnessing a rise of extreme right-wing parties in national parliaments and also European Parliament. Uh, we had Brexit. Uh, we have suspension of Schengen, like controls on internal borders. Um, so, uh, this obviously leads to additional fragmentation of, of, of the European space uh, and additional divisions between center and the periphery. So, to talk about Balkans specifically, <coughs> of course, Balkans has been, <coughs> uh, it has been part of the European border regime at least, I mean, since the 90s, right? Uh, mainly through the accession process to the European Union, but also to, uh, through the accession process uh, uh, to, to Schengen, uh, to the Schengen zone. Uh, of course, um, countries uh, uh, participated in this, or participate in this differential or ambiguous, as you said, banned ambiguous uh, inclusion uh, with the different speeds and with the different uh, uh, degrees. But uh, like after the refugee crisis, uh, uh, this uh, Balkan bordering management, or what, how, what, however you call it, uh, it just took a whole another level, right? Uh, um, so we can see that now, like all the way from Greece to Slovenia and Austria, uh, we are now uh, witnessing uh, new restrictive laws and measures. Um, there are uh, violent and brutal pushbacks all over the place, which are uh, being normalized and also even legalized in many instances. Um, along the external borders in the Balkans, there are still thousands and thousands of people stranded without any basic infrastructure, uh, without any serious possibilities to enter into any legal procedures, asylum procedures, basically with, without any possibi possibility to go further or to regular, regularize, so it's, it's, a, it's a limbo, right? Uh, there are new walls, new fences, as they call it, new technical barriers, right, all between uh, Balkan countries. Um, so this brings evidently new, new divisions, 
new walls between nations that have literally just start <laughs> started to cooperate and uh, <laughs> somehow uh, um, recover from the brutal civil war. So we, we come together, 30 years we are working to, to come together and now we are, you know, set apart again, right? And not just through borders, but li with literal physical uh, uh, barriers, right? So the humanitarian approach is, wow, also NGO approach or any kind of approach, solidarity approach is, is, is uh, reduced to a minimum or even criminalized uh, in many countries. We have this show, uh, show trials, or people call it uh, fear trials, when uh, refugees and migrants are being prosecuted for helping their friends and families to cross uh, forests and rivers across borders, right? And they're accused of being smugglers. And the sentences for smuggling are now already equated with those of murder in, in like 10, 15 years, 20 years for uh, smuggling. And also the definition of smuggling is uh, at the moment so broad that it virtually includes like any help, <laughs> right, to, uh, uh, to, to people on the move. Okay, since the crisis on, uh, on, on the Belar Belarus-Polish border, we somehow forgot this crisis. <laughs> Uh, there is talk of the weapon, weaponization of refugees, like we are now talking of refugees as weapons, right, which is like a whole other dis discursive level, right. Uh, yeah, and so Balkan is doing this, uh, Balkan states is, are doing this uh, bordering, um, yeah, let's just call it bordering inside of this, because, you know, the migration through Balkans is mainly transit migration. So I'm finishing and, you know, this is mainly bordering <laughs> to stop migrants coming into EU, but oh, doing all this while remaining mostly like in this permanent uh, uh, waiting room of EU and Schengen membership. Right. So, in short, the attempt to, to uh, govern migration uh, uh, has generated a whole range of new securitarian policies and practices uh, in, um, involving a broad range of uh, public but also private actors uh, turning migration management in, in, into a border industrial complex. I'm quoting someone here, I don't know who, but yeah. Uh, I'm over the top. Yeah, okay, I'll talk about the Ukrainian crisis uh, in the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for for this overview. Now, I would like to ask Marta, perhaps you can um, talk to us a little bit about how specifically this functions uh, in relation to Serbia. And of course, we're talking about transit migration, so I, I guess we cannot restrict ourselves to Serbia. But I think it would be an interesting case because from how I remember in 2015, 2016, Serbia took quite an important and pivotal role in the move in, in the governance of or in the government of migration across the Balkans. Um, yet, as we have just witnessed last week again, this has not been in inverted commas rewarded with a candidate status. So how does this ambivalent and ambiguous inclusion into the European border regime really work? if it does not rely on such formal uh, categories such as EU membership or candidate status? cannot look at migration uh, as something uh, from the perspective of uh, methodological nationalism. We always have to look at it as something that is going transnational. So uh, uh, regarding the migration through the Balkan states, uh, we should always uh, uh, see the position and the asymmetrical relations of the Balkan states over the European Union as the center toward which uh, all those policies and practices 
are uh, framed. Um, uh, so, uh, what uh, in uh, uh, 2015 migration, what later result as an organized corridor, uh, was a kind of um, um, cum cumulative process uh, done uh, here and there, for example, on the border in Macedonia, there were some processes that uh, enabled the faster transit by decriminalizing, uh, uh, taking public transportation from the south to the north. Uh, in uh, Serbia also, uh, fast, um, um, like, um, a reg a registration process in uh, Preševo. Uh, and also um, organized transportation between Macedonia, uh, Macedonia and Serbian border between two uh, smaller point, uh, points and so on. So it was a very slow process that later resulted in that one, what we know as formalized corridor. Uh, this was one transnational, um, really interesting um, development uh, that went through different states which are differently integrated into European Union and its border regime. Uh, but uh, in uh, Serbia was, uh, as the rest, transit country. It opened uh, a lot of, um, uh, actually, two uh, entry registration uh, points, uh, camps, and uh, several on the outer borders. Uh, when the corridor was stopped in March 2016, um, uh, all those uh, um, uh, camps, uh, uh, which were uh, transit reception camps, were trans uh, f uh, slowly transport, uh, transformed into uh, um, reception centers uh, for longer stay. Uh, so, uh, what uh, Serbia uh, and the other Balkan states got from uh, managing migration to EU? So, it was a policy not of welcome, but for welcome through. So, just, uh, it was, I don't know. It, that is, that is the, the difference probably in relation to Germany or some other states that we mentioned earlier today. Uh, so uh, the management focused on making people pass as fast as possible. Uh, with the closure, that changed, and also the narration uh, from we are uh, welcoming, we have experience from 90s and the wars, uh, wars uh, or the separation of Yugoslavia, uh, uh, it changed over the, um, uh, that uh, we also do not want people whom the European Union wants. But, uh, for example, uh, being a good partner to the European Union in 2015, in December 2015, uh, in enable Serbia to open first of the negotiation chapters with you. It, it was very concrete benefit. Uh, it wasn't related to, to uh, the migration itself, but Serbia showed that it is a partner to the European Union. That is what uh, all these uh, um, states along the route are showing. Uh, it also uh, enabled uh, cooperation on different levels between uh, Serbian institutions and uh, especially police uh, with uh, different police units uh, from different European Union states. Uh, this uh, uh, collaboration and also access to different fundings, not only of the European Union, but of the separate European Union states and embassies and also, for example, Switzerland and uh, states like that. Uh, so, um, also, uh, recently, uh, some official from the European Union said it is true that, the, for example, in relation to Turkey, we face a lot of uh, um, uh, problems uh, regarding the suppression of human rights and authoritarian regime, but Turkey is a valuable partner to the EU, so we will we'll not inflict any kind of um, repression over it. Uh, um, so. Uh, when the corridor closed uh, and people remained here. So uh, there was a kind of um, impression when the corridor closed, uh, no people will be here, but actually people continued to go through, uh, but they faced uh, different um, problems like um, uh, the geometrics of migration, like the routes 
changed and uh, in the end of 2016 when the border between Hungary and Serbia was totally closed, fenced off, and with a lot of violence happening on it, it diverted to, to Bosnia and Herzegovina. And then we had uh, 2018 and 2019 were the years when uh, uh, border between Croatia and Bosnia and Herzegovina was one uh, to which uh, the biggest violence was um, um, uh, like um, associated with. But later, again, uh, the routes uh, changed, uh, going to Romania, and then to, so, so geometry is changing. Uh, migra migration routes and migration is something that is evolving. It uh, it is always uh, um, uh, interactive. Uh, uh, there are um, okay attempts to to cross the borders, attempts to. Um, close them, or, or, uh, so the routes are diverting, but it, it never stopped. At the moment, uh, uh, what we have here in Serbia is uh, that are uh, uh, a couple of thousands of people on the northern borders trying to cross uh, into the European Union, mostly to Hungary again. Um, but um, uh, there are, besides the what we imagine, who are the people who are migrating, you know, Syrians, Afghanistan, so people from the, the states where the conflict is. But also we have um, a big migration, for example, from Tunisia. Why? Because uh, 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 the Tunisians do not need visas to come to, 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 to Serbia. Similarly, when uh, Serbia lifted the uh, visas for Iranians, we had the migration uh, of Iranian people also. Uh, uh, that uh, in, um, uh, how, uh, uh, it is not only the European Union that is using the, the states which are outside to make uh, to, uh, to outsource migration management, migration control, migration repression, uh, asylum um, procedures, uh, and also to create a kind of uh, border zones in which legality is not something that we should really stick to. Uh, 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 and uh, it is also uh, what the states are getting from it. Uh, for example, um, um, uh, you know that Serbia has that, uh, we, we already mentioned, asterisk in relation to Kosovo. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, Burundi, for example, did not uh, uh, redrew recognition of Kosovo as an independent state and was granted a visa-free entrance to Serbia. So uh, we had increase of citizens of Burundi who were coming here. So, so it is, migration is used as a kind of um, instrument that is um, um, uh, making, uh, to make pressures and uh, uh, to different political, pro different political processes that, that are not directly related to migration. Uh, so, uh, First, as I have mentioned in the beginning, uh, Serbia managed the uh, uh, start of the and uh, faster integration of the European Union and some of its institutions, but it also is very much used on different political um, uh, or, um, topics, uh, like this uh, in relation to Kosovo. Uh, so, um, uh, we also, all these uh, things are affecting much uh, people on the move, or passing uh, here and uh, uh, the changes uh, of, uh, so, so there as, um, as migration per se, migration policy is not directing to resolving migration, which is happening here, but it's just excuse to get access to the European Union or make another political uh, pressures. Uh, also, uh, people on the move are just, you know, money to fill camps to get fundings for the European Union because the European Union is funding the camps to open new uh, business sectors or in migration industry and so on. Uh, so um, this um, migration is a very like pliable and something that can be instrumentalized uh, <coughs> in, um, in different, in different uh, um, uh, aspects of political and economic life. Uh, because uh, the context is made that it is possible to do that. Uh, and uh, perhaps, um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, I would end that, uh, with uh, mentioning, to turn back to, to this, uh, the main topic of the, of the conference is cultures of rejection regarding the 
uh, right-wing movements because it was uh, first uh, for years uh, until actually 2019 uh, besides some individual attacks of people who are providing uh, aid to migration uh, to people on the move uh, not there wasn't the, the right is this discourse and uh, especially actions were not very uh, uh, present uh, in the end of 2019 uh, we had uh, like uh, Trans um, uh, implementation of right-wing uh, anti-migrant um, discourses in some um, uh, uh, parties who used to be parliamentary parties. And then we had the creation of one uh, vigilante group, uh, People's Patrols, who is uh, harassing uh, people on the move. But what they are doing, they're going to the northern borders where uh, people on the move are making uh, settlements from which they try to cross the border and they pull them back. So they're conducting pullback. Actually, they're doing, they're taking them back from the European borders and preventing them from moving further. So it is, uh, um, so, some very interesting uh, dynamics is happening. Uh, the discourse um, in Serbia, which has <coughs> non-existent welfare system, again, anti, uh, in anti-migrant discourse, is said migrants will eat our, well, they came here to get what? Money from the state. What? And our jobs. Yeah, and our jobs, of course. Which jobs? You know? So I would end with this. It's a very complex situation. I mean, it, we can talk <laughs> for hours on this. Thank you very much. Andre, how, now how can we make sense of all these transformations? Now we heard that the roads are shifting, the states have an interest in, in, in renewed bordering processes, the EU has an interest in bordering processes. So where does this development come from in the end? Oh, it's a, tr it's a tricky question. I, I wasn't <laughs> really ready for this <laughs> such question. Uh, no, um, I mean, certainly I can, I can answer indirectly, right? Uh, of course, we are, we are trying to understand um, uh, those cultures of rejection and the rise of uh, right-wing, right-wing populism, right, also, also in this region, in the border, uh, border areas. And uh, I mean, I will be quite anecdotal because actually this is what I can perform at this time <laughs> and because the, the pandemics basically uh, cut the, the research. No? I mean, the research that we were doing as activists, activists before and some change, some things change also when it comes in, uh, in the engagement in my life, right? Uh, I mean, I became more interested in uh, ecosystemic engineering <laughs> as, as, as a farmer uh, lately. Uh, but anyway, I, uh, so that's why I'll be, I'll be more anecdotal. Uh, but I'll try to, uh, to answer this uh, question, some uh, puzzling uh, questions that are posed to us in, since 2015 and the summer of migration. So I will, I will just start with the, with the first thing. Uh, I have... Uh, a deep feeling that uh, the problem actually when it comes to this uh, right-wing uh, reaction in the borderland like Balkans is non-existence of political and epistemological self-determination. Uh, I think it has to do with uh, also neo-colonialism uh, of the knowledge production. Uh, so, I will illustrate this, uh, when Slovenia uh, built the fence uh, on the border uh, in late, in the fall of 2015, it was after the, and I'm, I'm basically repeating myself <laughs> in the conference, I'm basically saying this, uh, but I think it's important. It was after the special session, extraordinary session of the Slovenian parliament in which the president of the, of the republic, uh, Borut Pahor, said, regardless the price, Schengen border should stay on the Slovenian southern border. Now, so actually, it was just pressure uh, of that time. Uh, you know, we had all these kind of forums in the core European countries talking about uh, re-establishment of the small Schengen, uh, so-called, right? Uh, so actually, and of course, also coming from specific history, right? I mean, my grandfather was... Uh, imprisoned in the concentration camp, and I think it's important, right? I mean, the, when it comes to the history of racism here, right? 
uh, uh, and uh, for me, of course, it was uh, very painful because this is the part of the of the family uh, of the family history and uh, and the memory. And uh, yeah, I s just started to think that it's just about uh, the territory that is incapable to think about itself because they back, uh, they actually dismantled. Uh, every uh, structures uh, uh, that would make possible uh, this self-reflection of the territory from itself. No? So actually it's just kind of a transfer of knowledge coming from the global centers of knowledge production and uh, um, of course we can also talk about the political economy on the university. That's why I'm also more and more distancing myself from from it because I think it's impossible to <laughs> to change things. Um, uh, I mean, this is my pessimistic maybe uh, uh, period. Uh, but then um, I would like to g go with another. Ending. So this is basically what what is driving me si since then. You know, to understand the question of is it possible to restore the capacity of this territory to think itself from itself? Is it possible to find? Uh, to, 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 to build the basis for the epistemological self-determination, which goes also with the political uh, self-determination of, of this territory. So there's another anecdote. Uh, so we'll try to make the continuity with the so-called advanced seminar on migration that we had in Rijeka. There was this interesting tension uh, during the seminar when uh, uh, colleague scholars uh, that are working on the uh, reception of people on the move in Gorski Kotar, at the end uh, uh, finished their presentation by saying, and there was really, I mean, it's really a lot of indignation in their voice, uh, that one lumberjack said to them about people on the move, about refugees, migrants, he said, but you know, uh, they are just like bears. We have to you know, kind of deal with them as with the bears. You know. So this was the scholar perspective. <laughs> and then there was an activist migrant, uh, Aigul Hakimova. Uh, she's really for years active in the migrant struggle. She's migrant herself. She was challenged um, about, uh, because he was, she was criticized for pushing the politicization of migration question. And uh, she, she, she said, uh, uh, I mean said, she basically shouted, but you know, we are all bears. Yeah? So actually it was this uh, kind of uh, gap between on the one hand, you know, indignation because of dehumanization of migrants, on the other hand, this kind of uh, appropriation of the animality. <laughs> No, by by migrants and migrant activists themselves. And so I thought, well, this is something you know that we really should look closer. Uh, then I uh, then I uh, again consulted uh, Werner Herzog, a documentary, The Grizzly Man. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this movie, um, and it's about uh, the guy that went for 13 years to live with grizzly bears. Uh, trying to build common world oh, with the grizzlies, but then he was eaten by the grizzly. <laughs> right? This is kind of a tragic story. But you had these three discourses that I tried to think about that, are, that exist in this movie. So the first is, you know, about you know, know cops, you know, rangers, and people like this were you know kind of claiming that humans and bears cannot share the world. It is either humans or it's bears. So we have to have you know clear division between those worlds, and then of course you have uh, this guy. Uh, his name was uh, Timothy Treadwell. Uh, so his idea is was that humans and bears can merge in single universal community, you know, community of universal love, and then you have indigenous. And for indigenous, they were surprised that he wasn't eaten before because he was so disrespectful. You know, to the uh, diverse form, alter form of being, which is which is bears. No, uh, so basically, I'm think I, I, I sort of think that this is this course that says that sharing the world demands recognition of alterity, respect for multiple forms of life, and that common world can only be produced through 
negotiation, so it's kind of, uh, could be produced for, co for cosmopolitic diplomacy. And then I also started to think again about Walter Mignolo and his um, uh, uh, analysis of coloniality of power. No? Uh, he's talking about two principles of the modern international relations that were established during the uh, colonial occupation of the Americas. So one principle is purity of blood and the other principle is rights of people. The purity of blood is, of course, that, uh, for example, Muslims should be uh, expelled from Europe and there should be, you know, like a hard border with this other. You know? But then when you have the uh, principle of uh, rights of peoples, it's about hier hierarchical inclusion of the new populations, of the new peoples that were colonized in the Americas, right? So these are like two principles that we have to think uh, when it comes to the uh, modern international relations. And, f and I think that basically globalized West, if I call it like this, oscillates now <laughs> among this, uh, those d first two discourses that you find in the Herzog movie, you know, and uh, among those two, those two principles. And I think that such oscillation is really uh, is basically geographically distributed. Uh, so you have a center, a uh, European center, your core countries that are bearers of universalism and periphery is the site of ethnic particularism. Of course, I, I got this idea also studying the uh, neoliberal constitutionalism in Bolivia, you know, prior to Morales, when actually they uh, recognized the rights of the indigenous but only on the designated territories, and they kind of reproduce this hierarchy of the people living in urban centers, whites, mestizos, and of course those cultures and peoples that are bearers of particularity and cannot, you know, kind of um, bear the universal, universal values. No, uh, so actually it's just about how to understand, you know, this. Uh, the dichotomy that we have all the time, right? On the, and we know that for the core European countries, it's very important that the periphery filters the, 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 the people that are crossing the borders, right? Uh, and of course, the, core, uh, the, the periphery countries are doing this quite willingly. But then you have this, you know, you have this kind of moral superi superiority of the European core, right? You know, so they are for human rights and so forth, and then there, there are these bad Croats beating migrants, breaking their bones, you know, and the bad Hungary, right? But actually, I think it's just, uh, there is no real contradiction, uh, contradiction in it, right? And we have to really uh, uh, start, to f start to think about this, no? Um, now, uh, so how to go beyond such uh, dichotomy? This is what we were trying to do in the, in the research that we were doing on the, uh, on the Balkan route. Uh, so actually, I would say, and I, I, refer, I would refer to De Castro, which is really like my, uh, one of the favorite authors, Brazilian anthropologist. Uh, I mean, the, the point of departure is that there is no background world that is objectively given to everyone. Uh, there are many worlds, you know, like Zapatista was saying, you know, for the world in which many worlds fit, right? And, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll just finish uh, quickly. Um, so there are many worlds and uh, there's also discussion nowadays about the political ontology, for example, the French philosopher Stangier, uh, she's actually talking about the political uh, um, ontology, which is actually a redefinition of the political, how to go beyond the tradition of the uh, isonomia, the equality, you know, the, the liberation in which uh, we are equal and have uh, opinions uh, to basically diplomacy in which we represent the cause for which we are ready to live and die and, and die for. Uh, so. During our research on the Balkan route, we introduced this notion of, and I will finish with this, assemblages of, of mobility. 
uh, I mean, it's still something that we are working on, maybe it's not perfect, but the, the idea was to portray migrant route which actually bends geographical spaces, it crosses and transforms them from maps to cloth, no? So to understand them as perspective that, are pop that is populated by many perspective, perspectives, many worlds, many bodies that are constituted by different bundles of effects, as for example, De Castro is talking about the body and the perception being uh, in the body. Uh, so basically to understand that there are many modes of being that are embedded in the environment in different ways, but highlight is on embedded and there is no canonic way of embeddedness. There is no canonic way of modes of, of, of being. So basically you now this is kind of invitation to introduce political ontology into the research on migrant routes. Uh, so to focus on plurality of agencies without canonic one. So there are different bundles of effects in the sense of relation to territoriality and mobility and to consider various agencies as forms of ad hoc non-state authorities that negotiate the ways we share the common world, which of course is always something to be produced for this negotiation. And this is something that we actually got uh, in Serbia, uh, but in the southern Serbia, in Preševo and Miratovac, <laughs> where you have, you know, the remnants of Albanian autonomy. You know, these remnants uh, that, of course, uh, after these 30 years are really rare now, because this space was pushed into the nation building uh, modern European nation building and actually uh, we hope that there is still the memory of this kind of a hegemonic political traditions that we can read through uh, this kind of relation that they establish uh, with the um, uh, people on the move and the struggles for for mobility so actually we try to give dignity to people on the move by saying that they are potent agents of decolonization of uh, this space. But if, I but if I understand correctly, this is not about, or this is about the assemblages of mobility. This is about overcoming the division between those on the move and those settled. But to understand, if you look at the particular compositions which you can find in place, um, to understand what has changed and what is coming together in novel ways, and if I if I if I get this correctly, so I would like to go back to Barbara and and ask, so if, because you have you have co-authored this paper with uh, where you were discussing the uh, assemblages of mobility, and what does it tell us about what has happened since 2015? Is it really just a return to old? Um, you have said there's more securitization, there we have more technical barriers. Is it really just descending into into a specter of sovereign violence? Or um, if you look at these assemblages of mobili mobility, do we see something new or different emerge from this? What is your take on that? Well, uh, you surprise me now. <laughs> Oh, it's difficult. It's difficult to say. I mean, of course, it's not only negative and uh, security. I mean, um, there are there are many struggles, um, many diverse struggles at various places. Even the movement, the continuation of the movement itself is uh, is a sort of a victory. That I would say. I mean, all this bordering, it's not succeeding, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, and you know this uh, movement is in a way facilitated by local assistance in a way it couldn't survive otherwise right so yeah there are these assemblages of mobilities that are mobile them you know mobile themselves <laughs> they pop up at different spaces right uh, and of course yeah this is um, <laughs> It somehow testifies to the strength of, of the migrants 
migrants themselves. I think uh, the, the most important struggles uh, and the most important victories are, are won by the people on the move uh, themselves. So they are a victorious uh, um, assemblage of, of mobility uh, in themselves. And uh, maybe another positive story about this um, um, post-2015 and 16 uh, period is maybe uh, <laughs> the building up of local solidarity struggles and knowledge production hubs in all of the countries and linking those uh, local struggles and knowledge production hubs which are uh, sometimes or most of the times the same people <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, uh, linking us together again because I think uh, it's really amazing uh, how uh, in a, in a par paradoxical way uh, this bordering uh, connected uh, Balkan people among uh, with each other right in this uh, uh, um, uh, horizon of struggle horizon of struggle so I mean uh, I, I know um, we started with this uh, migration anti-racist activism in 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 the end of the 90s in Slovenia and we were mainly referencing our struggles to Italy and Germany right uh, and the same is probably in Poland or you know there is always this discussion between uh, east and west and there was no discussion between among us right and now I, I, I must admit I'm really happy that uh, we finally <laughs> there are new actors emerging right and uh, these actors are really uh, starting to connect each other so maybe this is some kind of a local assemblage uh, of mobility in the sense that it's trans trans uh, uh, transnational uh, it's not moving, but it's, you know, <laughs> global, <laughs> transnational, uh, and in resistance. Thank you. Um, does this apply, would you say this applies to Serbia as well, this connection on what has, what is, what is left of the solidarity structures that have sprung up? After uh, after 2015, and would you would you characterize it the same that uh, despite the or because of the bordering that has characterized the the post 2015 Balkan, um, there are new connections and perhaps uh, th there has been created a new local center of gravity, like a new center of discourse, and does this work um, as a strategy against the culture of rejection? Uh, is it uh, what happened in Serbia in 2016 that uh, all those uh, grassroots and uh, autonomous initiatives to support people on the move differently, individual or organized, whatever, were suppressed uh, uh, by NGOization and later uh, by really repressive policies uh, of the state. For example, when they issued in November 2016 an open letter to stop with provision of any kind of tangible aid to people outside the state system, people who are encamped in the state system. Uh, so it was really suppressed and of course we have criminalization happening um, all the time and as Barbara explained uh, earlier, uh, that uh, even provision of, I don't know, food to someone can be read uh, as smuggling or supporting illegal migration or whatever. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, but this uh, disempowerment of solidarity uh, uh, forced people uh, to unite, to cross borders. And for example, in 2020, when uh, the pandemic uh, was, uh, Old, officially, uh, and when uh, it became obvious that we will be all confined to our homes and we cannot support people on the move, and for example in Serbia, the major support uh, of people on the move uh, outside the state system is conducted by uh, organizations uh, in which volunteer people from the European Union 
uh, so not by locals. Uh, so we knew that they will be forced out uh, to go. Uh, they could not stay. Uh, and uh, then uh, we formed a network. It was called, and it is called Trans-Balkan Solidarity Network to share information. And also because there is a knowledge that the person who is today in Serbia will tomorrow be in Croatia and push back to Bosnia, for example. So um, migration is transnational, it is not a national thing. And uh, this is how uh, uh, this, this empowerment forced people to unite uh, into, into, and to share information, knowledge, and uh, practices, and what, what, what else they can. Um, so it is ambivalent, so we cannot say if it is better or not, but uh, yeah, what is good that uh, now it's completely obvious that uh, migration is not one time event, it is not like crisis, it is something. And also as uh, knowledge about migration is growing, it also becomes uh, obvious that the, the same processes were happening in the past, but were not uh, named as such, for example, pushbacks, that was happening all the time, but didn't have a name. Uh, and uh, also, um, uh, what also, uh, simply this uh, interconnectedness of uh, people who are uh, pro-migrant, uh, who are, I don't know, for respect of human rights and so on, are forcing them to cooperate within themselves. So it is a good a kind of development. No, it is, for me it is very interesting because it, it kind of signals a different paradigm of, of political or organization of solidarity, that it brings up the trans transnational nature of migration, that it is adapted by organizations of solidarity, by political movements. And I remember that also in in, in our practice, it was very important to start connecting along the lines of, of migration in Germany, for example. And I wonder, and this is perhaps the last question I would give to all three of you, um, if this is a, a model that we could generalize across the Balkans, across the Mediterranean, um, is that a possibility of building a different political structure that can, can think along along the roots and that can learn from the memories and from the experiences and the knowledges that circulate on these roots and that can thus also gain a completely different territoriality or a different form a way of uh, reflecting about such categories well, well you know, I, I mean just one footnote so for example it was Manuela that uh, mentioned in one encyclopedia social movements, something like this, when you were discussing the autonomy of migration, that it's not perspective on migration, but perspective from migration, no? So I think this is like for me, oh yeah, this is autonomy, right? <laughs> you know? uh, uh, and certainly, yeah, I think that we could uh, really, yeah, uh, kind of uh, introduce other geographies, right? That are not geographies of the, of the maps of the nation states, you know, which could be something like, uh, Silvia Rivera, Kusikang, uh, in Bolivia, she's talking about tejido, you know, which is like a feminist principle, right? Uh, so it's not about the categories, you know, it's not about the political map uh, with, you know, different colors of the homogenized nation states, but actually, you know, something that goes through relations, right? I mean, you build the relations. And we have to know that in the, in the times of the uh, uh, Balkan route, I mean, when it's really like, I mean, it still exists, right? But when the struggle was really high, it was really struggle about who can access the route. You know, the, the first thing that state did was that all non-state actors or non-sanctioned state actors were kicked out. You couldn't approach anymore. You know, and this was like, this is the, I think this was the biggest. I mean, from the point of view of the activists, it was the biggest, basically, uh, basically struggle. You know? And I would say also something else. What was really interesting when I was uh, doing a bit of research, as I can, I mean, uh, material, well. uh, for example, in, uh, also in Serbia uh, and in Bosnia and Herzegovina, there was a lot of uh, completely uh, unusual suspects, you know, that were involved 
I mean, it will expand. It's not uh, NGOs, activists, you know. You have all kind of priests involved, you know. I mean, you have a kind of... Uh, and I think it's something positive, you know. I like this postmodernity, <laughs> right? <laughs> There's no, you know, it's not a single rationality, you know. I mean, you really have different uh, cosmovisions, ontologies that exist, and I think mean, we have to go into the dialogue, you know. I think it's it was something that, yeah, it's, it was there, and and for this reason, I think that this kind of roots, uh, especially because there are non-state and the subjectivities on the roots are basically non-state subjectivities of course then they you know try to and this is the problem I, w I would also n mention another industrial complex which is civil society industrial complex right? <laughs> that then tries to you know through the integration and so forth and but this is something you know to kind of destroy this uh, um, this other ontology uh, for example, when we, when we discussed with, with refugees in, in, in Ljubljana, you know, they were saying, you know, what we are actually missing is, you know, the kind of the community. You know? And they still remember, you know, uh, and this is something that they are bringing with them, you know, a kind of practices of community building, solidarity, which is incredible. But then you actually, for the integration policies, you individualize them. Because integration is just about to make person individualized in relation with the state. So to establish complete asymmetry of power. And I think that it's uh, too, too much, you know, of the also civil society organizations that are playing this game. Which again, uh, I mean, the other thing that Manuela mentioned <laughs> in this uh, small, uh, in this short text, no? Was you know this question? No, I mean uh, the, the the question of the um, communitarianism. Yes. You know, I mean these are communities. These are people that are capable to build the communities, and let's not help the state to individualize them, but rather learn from them. You know how to be how to be communities. Thank you. I remember this discussion in 2016 with the Médecins Sans Frontières in, in, in Greece because they have this very particular practice, of course, of creating mobile clinics that are not nevertheless like they are static. And they said what they actually what we actually would need to do is we should travel with people and then come back and travel again because this is how we can actually provide uh, health care to people, we can't just you know interface with them for a, for a day or for an hour and then they're gone and that's not how proper healthcare works. So I think this would be also be some kind of community building. Um, can I invite Barbara or Marta, any thoughts? Or open up to the... But I think before we open up, we, we will take a short you say short break okay we will take a short break but i will take the time to thank all three of you thank you very much for the for the discussion